There's a pretty one, Ulysses. There it is. Well, hello, BookTube. I'm Sean Breathes Books. Welcome back to my channel and another Friday Weeds. I don't have a whole lot of news this week, but let's see. Personally, mm, oh, I had uh, a couple uh, Biblio Adventures TM the Book Cougars this week uh, of a more social variety. One was I took Sharon Butala out for birthday cake and coffee last weekend. She, her birthday was Saturday, and I took her out for cake and coffee the next day. And it was our first social outing ever, so that was lovely. Other than having a great rapport on Zoom, we had never socialized. That was really fun. I won't tell you any of the the gossip that we traded back and forth, but we had a lovely chat, and I hope we're going to do it again. So that was wonderful. And uh, a little bit similarly, going back to my hometown, one of the families that lived near us, had their farm near us, and that we were the closest with from the time I was born. The matriarch of that family, I won't mention her, even her first name, don't need to. She is now quite elderly and, sh oh my goodness, her mind is just bump, bump, bump. And she's living in a uh, senior's home in Saskatoon, newly, newly moved to the city. The last time I saw her, she's always been a reader and she still loves to read. But she now pretty much relies on large print books. I volunteered to try and find some for her. Her retirement home has a library, and I saw it the other day, and they have, you know, fairly wide selection of books, but nothing large print. Hello! <laughs> so I took it upon myself to um, peruse the uh, online library catalog for the Saskatoon Public Library, and they have quite a vast collection. And so I put some on hold and went and picked them up and went over to see her yesterday, and she was quite pleased. I brought her three books, and I uh, have a good idea of her reading taste. Maybe I'll, I'll tell you what her reading taste is, and some of you might, you don't need to bother checking to see if they're in large print editions. I can do that part myself, but she likes um, adult fiction. I don't think she distinguishes between literary fiction and other genres. She's not fond of romance, but she likes stories with children in them not written for children although she would consider that but adult you know basically family novels that's one of the kinds of books she likes the best and the other one is uh, stories uh, adult novels that or i guess it could also be non-fiction with animals in them so dogs cats and any other kind of animal so i found a few already that i've given her and we had a delightful visit and she's uh a special woman, always has been a very special woman in my life, and I'm happy to be doing this little little favor for her, so, so that's great. Oh, and I, my mom's on a trip this week, so I have had Charlie here for uh, a week, or t tomorrow it'll be a week, and mom's coming home tomorrow, so that's been interesting. He's tired today, and he's sleeping at my feet, so he's not bothering me. He often bothers me when I'm at the computer. He doesn't like it when I'm working at the computer. Thankfully, I don't work very much, but I, you know still teach uh, some classes on Zoom a uh, couple, two or three nights a week. And when I'm doing that, he just really resents my attention being diverted from him and he's causing all kinds of mischief. But anyway, so the main event today is my mystery guest. This is a, a different kind of mystery guest than I've had for a long time. I think many of you will be very interested in it and it's going to be the main event of this Friday Weeds. Although our conversation again went long, so I'm going to release the unedited, not unedited, but the full-length version as a separate video later on, but here is maybe the first uh, 20 or 30 minutes of it. Let's meet, the, or shall I say re-meet, this week's mystery guest. And wow. I, will, I will say inappropriate things, so, you know, in your editing room, oh. I, won't, I won't feel bad if you cut anything out. I'll only edit out the appropriate things. <laughs> you got it. Well, boys and girls, um, this mystery guest is, needs no introduction. This is Adam of, uh, formerly of Memento Mori. Adam, I mean, formerly, I just posted a video, you like did, two weeks actually. ago, John. One video a year that still counts for being part of the community. 
correct? Well, it does when you get more hits on that one video than I've gotten, from, you know, on any of my videos in the last year combined. <laughs> Can I start in saying um, thank you for having me on your channel? I'm a li So since we last talked, it's been a couple years since I've been on the channel, you have changed the name, okay? Sean the Book Maniac, um, which I do like the new name better. I think it's more classy. I think the book maniac was a little unhinged. I, I will say the difficulty is that I have a very twisted mind. So I want to say Sean breeds books. Okay. And it's very yes. difficult. It's breeze. Okay. I'm B R E E D S. I'm thinking. That's probably how most of us say it, unless we're really yeah. working hard at enunciating that TH. Yeah, was that on purpose? No, I, it's be, I I wish I had thought it through a little bit more. I could have done something with instead of breathes, I could have done breathing. It's a lot easier to pronounce, isn't it? Or breather, but just breathe is actually the the most difficult conjugation to. It's to simple say. to say, but it, reading it, it sounds good. I mean, it, it is yeah, it it's does. a great title. No, it, it it is a much better title. But what what kind of prompted that change? As well, I, I I just thought it was time for a change, and uh, you know I can't do any I can't give myself a facelift, but I can change my name. So there you go, <laughs> a fresh start. I love it. What did I tell you one time when my last trip to Thailand? I tried to get a, uh, this little like stuff down here removed with lasers. I went to a, a, a you know a place where they do procedures, and there was one where they inject lasers into your um it goes through the skin and it reshapes your jaw and i thought you know put me in the machine put me in the machine and let's you know just tighten it up a little bit and these young women they look at me and they say um no that's just fat you can't get rid of it through lasers that's just fat like i was there willing to give you my money put me in the machine sean <sighs> it's meant to be though yeah. And and uh, what the hell are good are lasers for if they can't deal with fat, for Christ's sake? Yeah, yeah. Are you saying the lasers can't go through the fat to reshape my bone? <laughs> like we're living in 2024, for Christ's sake. I hope they didn't charge you for that advice. <laughs> no, they didn't. Um, my significant other was in the next room getting a procedure done, so... <laughs> Apparently, he was, not, he was not too fat to get the, the, the work done, but... Uh, it's meant to be because it's a slippery slope, Sean. You get one thing done, and suddenly, you know, you're looking like, uh, what's that guy? That Republican, Matt Matt Gates. Oh, Matt Gates. <laughs> looking like don't a cat. sound like him. No, yeah. you don't sound like him. So, how was the Re Republican National Convention for you, Adam? Oh, God, it's embarrassing. It's just, it's just an absolute mess down here. It's going to be a wild uh, fall. And uh, I'm just like, you know, Trump's going to win 100%. Um, yeah, I you know, think so. Absolutely. I don't care who they prop up on the other side. And it's just, it's chaos. But at least well, like, this time we're planned for it, right? Because um, the world's so you're going to come up and live with me in Canada? That's right. Yeah. Let Kenji know. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Can I live on the farm? I, I don't know about living in, in where you live, but I'd like to go to the farm. And, and um, well, the farm how would your mother feel about that? Well, as long as she doesn't watch any of your videos first, she'd probably say yes. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do hard labor, um, mm -hmm. but you know, maybe as the, 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 you know, I could <laughs> do some, the cows. I don't know. Is there cows there? There's no cows there. But I, I can churn butter. <laughs> I don't know what they're doing on farms these days. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm not going to ask how, how you learned that skill, but. <laughs> in Thailand. <laughs> Alrighty then. So um, have you been reading anything, Adam? I have. I've, I've had an incredible year of reading and it's been a reflection of my own mental health. And I, I wonder, you know, do you take stock in that? Because how my reading year is going, how often I'm reading, how much I'm retaining is often a reflection of just my overall, overall well-being. Um, do you find that as well? Oh, absolutely. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. So, so I've been um, in a very good mental space, everybody, um, and it's resulted in me reading um, really good books. 
So, and a lot of them are really chunky. So, yeah, big books. Oh my gosh, I'm, I'm hitting an average of like 290 per this so far this year, which is good. Though that means I'm reading like real books, not these little, you know, 170 page uh, translated fictions that we're working through like a conveyor belt and pretending like we're, you know, some kind of literary aficionados, right? I resemble that remark. Oh, I know. Well, you were back. Remember those golden days when you were trying to cut down your reading and not read so many books at one time? Well, I'm, I'm on that kick as well now, actually, yes. It's what? You're doing 15? 15, 15 at a time? Sean, 15, yeah. that's obscene. See, I had to get out of that. And of course, we're all different readers and we all consume in different ways, right? Um, but to me, I, I was at a point where I was feeling like a conveyor belt. And, you know, I... I used to like the idea of like a big stack of books and you take one book and you read a chapter and then you put the next and then you read another. And for you, you would say that like works for you. Well, I don't know that it works. Um, it's more manageable with 15 than it was with 52. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But really, the books that I finish are the ones that I'm buddy reading and the other ones I just pick up once every couple of weeks. So I'm not sure that that works well, but uh, it's, it's all right for now. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sticking to just one book at a time for right. sure, but I am, um, you know, for example, if I have a thick book, um, I will break it up into a good size chunk and only read that, you know, for, for a period of you know, a week or, or however long. Um, right. And then we read something slimmer and, and kind of work through it. So that has really improved my reading life because I've, I've just retained more. I'm feeling more, um, entrenched in, in the novels and the books that I'm reading. So that's resulted in, in a lot of big books, but just better reading overall for me. So it's been good. That's good to hear. Uh, for example. For example, so we're, we're going to go through this as a mystery guest. I don't know how much yes. time I have. Okay, people, I don't have free reign. I'm under the control of Sean's editing abilities. We got 20 uh, so minutes. We got 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're gonna we're gonna do a little uh, past, present, and future of my reading. Okay, what I have been reading, what I am, and what I will be, and we're gonna run through them relatively quick. Okay, great. So a couple books. These aren't necessarily the last books I've read, um, but there are a couple notable ones that I, I did want to mention because they are. I'm on BookTube. So I want to talk to the kids and, you know, th this is the hot stuff that, that you all are reading on here. So I'm, I'm coming down to your level to talk about <laughs> some of this stuff, you guys, it's too obscure for you all. It's too obscure. Okay. He stoops to conquer. <laughs> all right. So the, the first one, um, I'm a bit late on the train with this guy, but uh, I finally did catch it, which is uh, Jan Foss's Septology. Okay, I finally hey. dove into it. This won the Nobel Prize for Literature a couple years ago, yeah? That's right. And uh, I've been putting re off reading it for a while just because it is, is a big guy, but it was such a wonderful reading experience. And I was a little worried because the premise is it is about a man in a, a, a rural, um, in Norway, in a rural town, and he is an artist, a painter, and a very successful painter. And in the next town over, there is another artist with the same name, who's also a painter, who is not successful. And one day, our main protagonist goes to this town, and he finds this man passed out in the snow, um, drunk, and he takes him to a nearby hospital, and it kind of veers off from there. And I was a little worried with that premise, because it's obviously very you know, they're kind of parallel lives of um, this other man representing a different path of which our protagonist could have taken under different circumstances. And that sort of thing is is interesting, but I didn't know if I wanted to read, you know, 700 pages of that. Um, but I really respect Foss for keeping that idea at arm's length. And really it was this deep, intimate character study of this man, what it means to be an artist, what it means to produce art, um, and that whole thing with the other guy 
uh, was really just kind of a tool that was kept at arm's length that allowed us to, to really get to know this guy. So it just was kind of one of those books that put you in a trance. And um, uh, I finished it, um, you know, just feeling like I, I needed to start it all over. There's like, there's so much more within it. So are you, are you interested in Foss? I, I am. I've read one of his novellas. Oh yeah, how yeah, I yeah. Have it, that was, one. it was trance like is the perfect word. Yes. Alice at the Alice at the fire, and Alice is spelled A L I S S. And I couldn't. Uh, I read it four years ago. I couldn't uh -huh. tell you much about what it's about anymore, but I can remember the trance of it. It was just uh -huh. a. Mesmerizing. It's like, it's like my face. It's the light and the dark, right? And it's just a combination of both, right? It's that's right. Absolutely. The left hand of darkness is the right hand of light. We need good and bad in this world to survive, Sean. Do you agree or disagree? Yes, you're really balancing out my light, my spiritual <laughs> lightness, Adam. <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm not Sean. I look like I'm high, I'm sweating here. I, I don't want your people to think that I'm like, you know, tweaking out over here. It's very hot, okay, in Seattle. Okay, so can you please put this in and let everybody know that I am melting, um, but I am also going for a little bit of drama here with the light, okay? Absolutely, and uh, you know, like I say, I know I have this effect on all my mystery guests. Okay, oh, <laughs> please, okay. The other book I briefly wanted to mention, which I really wanted to sell to you, if it's not all on, on your radar, is Praiseworthy by Alexis Wright. Uh, this was a huge surprise to me because I got to say, Sean, uh, first of all, Alexis Wright is an Aboriginal Australian author. She's had a, a long career. This is the first thing I've read by her. And the, the kind of pitch is not my sort of read. I'm not into... Um, what seemingly could seem like whimsical, social justice, hot topic sort of stuff, okay? And, you know, saying the, the premise of this, it very much sounds like that. Um, it's about a, a fictional Aboriginal town in Australia called Praiseworthy. Um, there is a mysterious haze that is surrounding this whole town. And within this town, we primarily follow this family uh, of four, and each of the members of the family very distinctly represent uh, a, a fraction of Aboriginal life. So you have a father who is very much in touch with the land. He's determined to save this town through the land by searching down these wild donkeys for which he wants to, to create a, a transit business with these donkeys. You have a mother who's surrounded by butterflies and moss, and she's daydreaming about saving her family and bringing them to, to China. And then you have their children, one of which is a boy who's convinced that, that all the aboriginals around him are pedophiles, and he wants to be saved by the white man. Uh, and then the other son who near the beginning of the book kind of disappears into the ocean. And, and there's a mystery of whether he killed himself or if he's still alive or or what um so so that sort of stuff that description is would give me a warning sign okay because it is you know i don't like the w word of whimsy but there is a certain level of that but this was the most singular reading experience i've had in years the that's wonderful yeah writes uh writing um lyricism the way she chopped it up and and structures this story it was just, again, much different than the Foss, but something you would just get lost in the waves of this literature. And I've just, I've never quite read something like it. And it was just, it was phenomenal. I'm goosebumps. It's not even from the heat. I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it, Sean. Well, I've heard nothing but good things about it. And the fact that you yeah. also loved it to that degree, I, I'm really uh, sold on giving it yeah. a try. And I, I know you're someone that also is, you know, you know, the dreaded magical realism and whimsical and words, you know, stuff like that you, you tend to veer away from. Has that changed okay. in recent years or what do you think? I'm, I'm a little bit more moderate with it. I can, I can appreciate it when it's done well or when it hits me right. I'm not, it's not part blanche. I will not go near it yeah. type of response anymore. Yeah. If it's something that's whimsy for the sake of being whimsy, I have a difficult, you know, problem with it. But if it's done well and it, it 
really pluses the story, then um, I'm all for it. And, and Alexis Wright did it, and I can't wait to read her her other stuff. She has a, a, a big catalog of, of stuff. Absolutely, so. yeah. Exactly. And look, so what are you currently crazy. reading, Adam? My light, yeah. And first of all, my light has now stabilized. I it has. <laughs> I have a nice glow. Look at this. We've made it to the fire. The sun goes down. Oh, we made it, people. All right. So what? So what? Uh, so we talked about a little bit what I have been reading, um, or what I finished, and now I'm going to talk about what I currently am in the middle of. One really big guy and one short one. Uh, the big one. This is Marshland by Orohiko Okaga. This was- uh, I'm curious about this one. Yes, just published by um, Dalki Press, who does the most amazing releases. They're, they're really incredible. They're always late on publishing stuff. They announce stuff and then it comes out, you know, two years later when it's supposed to, but they put out a lot of big stuff, a lot of translated stuff and, and, and really good um, unknown kind of, you know, digging stuff up from, from the grave. So they're great. But this was originally published in 1985 massive 900 pages so it's a big guy oh gosh it it's so good you know a couple of those those uh books that i i just talked about and a lot of my reading this year has been i don't want to say experimental because i don't like that word there is no such thing as experimental anymore everything's been done okay but <laughs> but we'll, we'll say they're maybe a little um unconventional in their style and structure um and not to call this conventional by any means but it is you know, this big sweeping epic with this large cast of characters. It plays with, with time and structure a little bit, but it is more traditional in, in the sense of, of the novel. It takes place in the late 60s during university riots um, that were happening within Tokyo and, and surrounding areas. Yep. Are you familiar with that? Fascinating part of modern Japanese history, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's interesting to learn about that, and it's the main protagonist is Atsuo, and he wa is a veteran from World War II. So there's some kind of uh, post World War II politics thrown in there, mixed with the, these protests and, and the history revolving around that. There's stuff about ice skating. Um, there's stuff about the marshlands, which is I don't know whether it's northern or southern Japan, but rural areas that you know that are covered in these marshes where, um, you know, primarily where I'm at, I'm 200 pages into it. Primarily we're in Tokyo now, but um, he has a nephew who, who lives um, in these, these marshlands. So it's going just in all of these different things. And it is, again, compared to what the other things I've been reading this year, much more plotty and kind of sticky and, and, and just kind of a big novel you can get stuck into. So um, I'm excited. Yeah, I want to. I want to ask you to talk about that adjective "sticky." I mean, I don't know what you mean by that, and I'm very curious. Just like you know, you just feel, you know, a book where you can get take the time to get to know these characters and get stuck in the atmosphere and have all these different branches of areas. You know, you might not be interested in in this protest going on, but maybe you like the ice skating stuff or, or the World War II stuff, and you had this life is crime. So there's all these different areas, and I love a book that kind of gives you, which I guess is the opposite of sticky, but gives you different avenues to go down. And maybe not all of those avenues are, are your thing, but as a whole, it is, you just kind of get stuck in the novel, okay? Do you know that experience? Um, I do, and that really sounds like a Sean book. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, order it, order it. The other, moving on from a very big book to a very short book, this is a, also a new release, this is, Wait, backwards. Flunker by Dennis Cooper, his latest release. Now, what is your opinion on Dennis Cooper? I am inter I always enjoy hearing you talk about him. I have no desire to read him myself. Why? Um, he's just a little bit too dark for me. Yeah. Yeah, so I like to, to be refracted through your spiritual uh light light lightness so that i can actually kind of you know, yeah well maybe that. because i have such kind of a light energy around me that yeah. i need that darkness to kind of balance it out right we're not talking about the light outside anymore but just you know i i have such kind of a light soul that i do need these very dark dark books to balance it out sean um, so maybe well, you're just. I, I, would, dark I, I think you i think you use the word adjective light but i i would suggest it should be lightweight Oh, oh gosh. <laughs> I 
I'm really concerned your people are going to think that I'm on something because I'm sweating people. It's the middle of summer. These people are going to watch. The, you know, these are evergreen content in which I'm in on your channel. People are going to tune in in the winter and be like, what's going on with this guy? It's 82 degrees here and nobody in Seattle has AC. Okay. Well, I, I, I don't think any, many more people are going to be wondering what's going on with you than, than normal, Adam. <laughs> Dennis Cooper, Flunker. This is, uh, again, was just published a couple weeks ago by a press called Amphetamine Sulfate, which is a really cool publisher in, in the U.S., and they publish a lot of weird, dark stuff, uh, you know, very gritty. So it's a really big get because they're, they're, they're very small press. So to get an author like Dennis Cooper is, is quite a, a big thing for them. And it, he is, you know, this is a collection of six stories, and I'm working my way through. But it is very cool to see because he is kind of this cult author. He writes very dark, queer stories. All of his stories have um, young gay men going through really horrible stuff. There's body horror. Um, there's, you know, punk music. He definitely has a, a certain atmosphere within all of his books. But through that, there is really a heart beat there. It's not just salacious for the sake of being gritty and dark. And that's rewarding to me because when I was young, um, I did. I just wanted to read the most disturbing stuff I could. Uh, you know, I wanted to push that button. But as I, and I, as I get older, I still appreciate that side, but I want something more to chew on once you kind of get that initial adrenaline of, of the gross out, right? Um, so I, I, I've really loved aging with Cooper. And I've also loved seeing a whole new generation of readers, especially, you know, young gay men who are discovering him. And his books are, are you know, still being published and, and, and being put out there. And there's a whole new generation of Dennis Cooper fans. So this, I don't, um, I'm working my way through. It's very short, but I love so it. So do you think that it, your new experience of him, is that his evolution, your evolution, or a mixture of both? Um. My evolution, because the That's work good. was all it, within his own work. It was always there. Um, it, absolutely. Okay. And I, I definitely think as he's aged, he certainly has put, you know, there is more of a heart and a pulse to his work. But even his older work, it's not. And, and a lot of these guys, I look at, um, what's the American psycho guy? Um, the Brady um, Um, You know, they're, they're, when I was young, I read that to get a quick high. And then I was done with it. And now I can read it. And I don't like him quite as much, but I can get more out of it. So I'm, I'm growing up, Sean. I'm growing up. I'm, a, I'm an adult. No. I've been waiting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. boys and girls, we are out of time for my, my mystery guest spot. But we're going to continue this chat. And the unexpurgated version is going to go up on my channel in a few weeks time. So I will do a, a thanks Adam for this chat and then come back to my channel. See you in the next time. one. See, See you in the next one. one. So Adam, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, Sean. It's been great being here. So it was great for me to reconnect with Adam and I'm sure you feel the same as I. Stay tuned for the full length video. I'm not sure when, but, but it'll come along eventually. All right. I forgot to mention that my cough is still gone like I'm you know it's back to normal levels I'm fully functioning without coughing all the time I'm so happy about that so my energy is coming back to the degree that I did get one video that I've been working on editing up this week that was the David Carpenter chat and this one about the book that he translated early in his literary career that I have already talked about quite a bit on this channel I read it early this year I believe or late last year Georges Bounier's La Forêt, The Forest, translated from the French by David Carpenter. He had a wonderful long chat about Dave's friendship with Georges Bounier, who he met when Bounier was 95 and had been forgotten by Canadian literature for decades and decades, and all about the book. So do check that out. It is actually, as I've said, pretty much any, uh, as I've said, I think every time I've talked about that novel, The Forest, on my channel... Um, it's one of the best marriage novels I've ever read. It's many other kinds of things, that story, but it is a marriage novel, and it is a literary treatment of communication in marriage. It's so well done that it's you could almost read it as a 
manual on how to communicate with your partner. Like I say, it's many other things, but it's unforgettable for that. So, that chat, which I had last January, is finally up on my channel. And I almost got another one edited, so it'll be coming to the, my channel soon, but this is the first time in several weeks that I've actually got at least one video posted in between my Friday reads, so I'm on the road back. Uh, just a quick uh, reminder to anybody who's considering joining my Patreon, I'm always, uh, I would welcome your support, and if you join in the next few hours, in the next 12 hours, say, you'll be in time to participate in this month's Bookish Brunch, which is, which is a Zoom chat for all patrons to chat about what they've been reading, and that's going to be on Saturday afternoon. So please join us if you'd like. Okay, so we're almost done here because my reading has, I again, got very close to finishing three books, but in fact I only finished one. Elena Knows by Claudia Pinheiro, translated from the Spanish by Francis Vito, an Argentinian novelist. She mainly writes crime novels, and this was kind of a departure for her, from what I understand, in that it... It wasn't so much of a mystery or a crime novel, but the I, I loved it. It was a five-star read for me. I had some qualms or some questions about it. I'm going to talk about those in a non-spoilery way, but I did it on audio. The audio was wonderful, and the opening premise is that Elena is an elderly widow, I believe in the suburbs of Buenos Aires, Buenos Aires and her daughter was found hanging from the church belfry. Is that the right word? But the bell over the church or in the near the church or something, and she was found hanging there, and her death was ruled a suicide. But Elena knows, that's the operative verb, that phrase, Elena knows, is repeated over and over again in the novel. And by the end, you kind of see why, what uh, Pinheiro was up to with that repetition. But she knows that would never be possible because her daughter was superstitious and kind of afraid to go near the church when it was raining, and it was raining that day. So Elena says, no, she was murdered. Somebody murdered her. And so it's kind of a detective story. That's the premise. What's much more important and, what's more, and much more well done, I had some problems with some of the plot points here, but what's really well done is Elena has Parkinson's disease, quite advanced stages, and so she has mobility is an incredible challenge for her. And sometimes she can't really move until she, t she has to wait for her, t until it's time for her to take her next pill. And then she can move. That, that hampers her ability to do the detective work. I have to say that if I was living in that town and I knew her daughter, Rita, I might have been the one that murdered her. I couldn't stand her daughter. She's probably my most hated character in fiction. So. She had a lot of stress put upon her be to, to take care of her ailing mother. I see that, but I still hated her guts. Was glad that she died. <laughs> and I loved the mother. And I loved being inside of her head. And I don't think I'm going to say anything more about the plot. I will just say obliquely, there is another character that we meet that has an experience, I'm going to say this very obliquely, but there's another character we meet in the book who was held captive for a while. And that part of the story I thought was unbelievable. I didn't, didn't buy it. By the end, it didn't matter that I didn't buy it because there were so many things that did work. But that, I thought, mm, why couldn't she have escaped that situation? I mean, she was under some duress, but still... It went on a long time, and there was lots of, I think, ways that she could have sprung free before it came to the end that it came to. So that, that's all I'm going to say about that. But that didn't quite work for me. Maybe that's the only thing. that um, By the end, I did kind of get the fact that Elena doesn't understand her daughter. That That's human nature. So that's the end of my kind of qu the qualm section of this mini-review. But... To get back to the themes of uh, bodily autonomy and women's freedom and or lack thereof was explored just so richly in this novel. I really, really enjoyed it by the end. There's lots of surprises. 
I recommend doing it on audio. I, th I thought the audio was wonderful. I can't wait to read more by Claudia Pinheiro. But, like I say, there was this one little plot thing that was pretty central to making the plot work. But you, um, you know me. I don't really care about plot. I care about characters. And the characters in here are unforgettable. So, that was a big hit. Even with one misgiving. So that's what I finished. I have two more that I'll be finished with this weekend. Because I have to keep on track. I'm starting to let go just a little bit of this whole 15, 15 book limit. Not that I'm going to go crazy, but sometimes I just don't get something finished. But just stay on track with my next buddy read or whatever. I, st I have to go one or two over and it's only going to be four days before I'm back down to 15 or below. And that's and uh, you're, I'm not going to be explaining that on a weekly basis because it's not very interesting to listen to. But here's what I'm going to be starting. I'm going to be starting three books. Of the many readathons happening in September, there's one that maybe some of you don't know about yet. I'm delighted to tell you. A bookstagrammer, Nora, she was a guest on my Bite Size Book Chats sometime in the last year. I adore her, and she has created Spinster September, which is reading spinster fiction. And uh, what a, I mean, hello, Barbara Pym et al. Oh my goodness. So I am going to participate as much as possible with all the other reading commitments I have. So I'm definitely doing two, because two of them I'm going to tell you about today, and I'm hoping to fit in at least one more short one. I'll put a link to Nora's Instagram and Twitter, and she does a, I think it's a Sunday Reads type of video on Instagram. She's just a wonderful bookish social media luminary. Our reading tastes overlap to a significant degree. I picked this up at a... I haven't had time to haul this. I'm behind on my book haul videos. But I picked this up at a charity shop type of deal. It's in perfect condition. Uh, Virago Modern Classics. E.H. Young's The Mrs. Mallet. So isn't that a fabulous color cover? This was originally published in 1925, and I just love that work of art. Obviously about spinsters. There are four Mrs. Mallets. The oldest two are large, jolly spinsters, and then there's a couple other Miss Mallets. And the American novelist Mona Simpson, who I don't think I've ever read anything by her. I don't think so. She wrote a novel about a spinster called Off Keck Road, published in 2000. And there's an audiobook on Everand, formerly Scribd. I'm going to try it. And if I don't like it, i got a whole bunch of backup spinster audio books to try. But this one I'm going to try first because it's only five hours long. And there's a spinster in it. I don't remember any other details. But Mona Simpson, if you didn't know, and probably most of you did know this, she is a full biological sibling of Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs was born to her parents when they were still unmarried and very young, and they gave that baby up for adoption. And that baby became Steve Jobs. And then they did get married, and one of their children, after they uh, got legally hitched, was... The, uh, the American novelist, Mona Simpson. So I'm going to start that on audio. And then the other one that I'm starting, the classic Canadian novel, The Stone Angel by Margaret Lawrence. And if you join my Patreon soon enough, this is the next book that we're doing for my Patreon book club. That chat is scheduled for the end of this month, I believe. So I'm going to get started. I read The Stone Angel when I was in high school. I was very young when I read it. I loved it. I don't remember much about it except kind of the, the vibes of the main character. And I've heard so much about it recently that I, I was really hoping that it would be get voted to be one of the books we do for the Patreon book club. And it was. So that's what I got. Thanks for watching.